The Garrison uh, massacre was, was one thing, but this thing now, the assault on the war. Legion, that's really, I mean, there's, there's no way that Rome can Can't take respond. this sitting down. There's absolutely no way. And there's going to be, there, you know, as the name of that film with Daniel Day-Lewis was, there will be blood. Early blood, <laughs> yeah. especially after this. There's a conflict that develops because Nero is in financial trouble. And according to other sources, not Josephus, he begins to even tell his uh, financial men, procurators, financial agents, to raid temples. And these are temples everywhere, even in, in Italy itself, right? Go around and take whatever you can get from the temples. We need money. Recall all the loans. Recall every resource you can get. Now, it looks like it was a result of bad financial you know, management on his part. We can't really say now for sure, but it looks that way. So he's trying to get all this money. And in, in the year 64 or so, when the great fire breaks out, he dispatches to Judea a, f a friend, well, uh, a guy whose wife was a friend of his wife. So, I mean, part of the sordid story of Nero is that he, uh, he had a wife and then he fell in love with the wife of a friend of his named Otto, who would become emperor later. But he dispatched him off as far as he could get rid of him out to the west. And, uh, and it took his wife as a, as a lover, first of all, named Poppea, Poppea Sabina, uh, and then married her. In 62, he married her. So there are all kinds of lurid stories in the Roman literature about her evil influence on him as well, uh, and that she had him bump off various people. Uh, so he marries her in sixty in sixty two. He will eventually kill her in sixty five. Wow. Uh, but when when Josephus visits Rome, they are a couple, and he says that it was she. Josephus claims she was a god fearer. She was uh, very supportive of the Jews. Wow! And she she helped him when he went to Nero's court to free some Jewish friends of his who were priests, who uh, Nero had, had kept as, as prisoners. And uh, Papia, his wife, was crucial in getting them released to go back with Josephus uh, in the year 64 to 65, somewhere in there. So all of this is going on at this time. And it's a very uh, tense period. And, yeah. and after this, so after the great fire, uh, of Rome, of course, Nero wants to rebuild Rome. And so he has, um, like his financial needs go through the roof, right? They skyrocket. He really needs to rebuild the city. He's in trouble. And he's really pressing everybody to get him money, resources. And that's the time, well, 64, 65, is when he sends this guy, Gessius Florus, as the procurator to Judea, and tells him basically gives him carte blanche and says just take money get money from the temple you know the the temple in jerusalem is known to be uh, one of the wealthiest maybe the wealthiest temple in in the roman empire wow why can can you if, if you don't mind my asking you as if you were in one of my classes yeah uh, can you imagine why the jerusalem temple would probably be wealthier than most other temples, like the thousands of temples throughout the empire. Because they raise taxes. Yeah, from? From the people, in, the Jews in the Eastern side of the empire, right? Exactly. Yeah. And not only in the, in the Roman empire, but even Jews in the Parthian empire. Right. To the East, they, all of them. And they get only... the seventh year where they can just bank and just collect and stack for that yeah. whole seventh. Yeah, That's yeah. A, people don't understand that. Can you explain that real quick? What the sabbatical year is? Well, actually, I'm not. I'm a bit reluctant to because okay. it's not clear how it played out in, okay. in practice. Um, you have 
it's just not clear how it, it worked in practice. Because according to biblical law, of course, in the seventh year, you should let the fields lie fallow and you shouldn't grow and so on. Uh, and then you have rabbinic laws about tithing and, and uh, the seventh year. But what actually happened on the ground in the first century, it's not so clear what accommodations were made for for the Sabbath. So I'm a bit I'm a bit reluctant sure. uh, to, to go there and say it was like this. Uh, I don't know. But what is clear is that Judeans everywhere in Alexandria, in the cities of the Eastern Empire, a Roman Empire, and all the Jews of the Parthian world. And there were, you know, uh, at least hundreds of thousands, probably millions of Jews living in, you know, Iraq, Iran, and those at Jordan and those areas. And they, not in the Roman Empire, but they still sent delegates every year with a mass of money to the temple in Jerusalem yeah. uh, because they, th th that was their only temple. So whereas other people, you know, worshipers of Apollo or, 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 or uh, out. Athena, yeah, they, they had a temple in their own city and they would store their money there. But that was relatively small, especially small. When, you, when you read Pausanias and you notice that every city might have two temples of Dionysus or. Oh, yeah. Oh, they're yeah. All over the place. Yeah, like, they might have do dozens of temples to yeah. different gods. Yeah, 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 exactly. So if you have one temple. In principle, I mean, there was a temple also in Egypt uh, for Jews, which is uh, a peculiar place, and we don't know much about it. Uh, Vespasian shut it down in 73, 74. But aside from that, um, which, is, which is a peculiar thing, uh, Josephus is clear and Philo is clear and other sources are clear that the temple in Jerusalem was the temple for Jews everywhere. So... When uh, Nero, of course, thought about it, he's seeing, well, not dollar signs, but, you know, Cistercius signs um, <laughs> in, in his eyes of, of money, right? And he, and he tells Gessius Florus, look, just go and you've got to take some money out of there. And, and talents, you know, ta a talent was like the uh, size of, you know, in the gym, some, some big, uh, you know, plate, like a 45 pound plate or something like that. I mean, they, they varied according to different scales, but that was one talent. And he has him go and take you know, eight talents of gold or, uh, you know, so many talents. And of course, who's his muscle to do this? Uh, he doesn't waltz in there himself and try to carry out this money. The, 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 the muscle is the auxiliary garrison. Uh, so not Roman citizens, not Roman legionary soldiers, but these people who have weapons, uh, I say weapons, not like a machine gun, but, you know, the weapons of the time, uh, swords and Spears. clubs. And they hate the Jews. Um, that's just by now clear, right? In, in, even in Josephus's account, mainly in the antiquities, he fills in the backstory to this, not so much in the war. But in Antiquities 19, it becomes very clear that the animosities between these, these uh, between the Jews and their protectors, the, the auxiliary army, is fierce. And so they go marching in with their weapons into the temple treasury and just take out money. So what happens now? Well, of course, you have the problem of how did the Jews respond to this? And it's very clear that everybody is outraged right but that doesn't mean that this was part of a his you know what i said at the beginning like there was some anti-roman zealot feeling dispersed throughout the population quite the opposite when the jews experienced this under gessius Florus, nero's agent who's just arrived they are furious because it's never happened before. This is not what you expect of the Romans. And their, their immediate instinctual response is to appeal to Cestius Gallus, who is the, the, the top Roman commander in Syria, right? He's, he's the senatorial ranked, uh, governor, uh, legatus. 
and they appeal to him for help. And he, he comes down and visits at Passover in the year 66, right? Um, and and the, the, the Jews flock around him and he says, is everything cool? You know, is everything good? Because his job is to maintain good relations with the local populations. And they say, everything is great. We have no problem with Rome, but we really, really have a problem with this guy, um, this, this uh, Gessius Floris. Can, can you get rid of him? Wow. Now, in the, in the past, the guy in that position, the position of Cestius Gallus, has been able to get rid of the lower ranked guy, uh, the, the equestrian governor. So, for example, Pontius Pilate was sent packing back to Rome by the, the, the guy who was in charge in uh, Syria, right, uh, Vitellius at the time. So, normally, he could do that. Normally, he could use his much higher rank to say, right, you go back to the emperor and you give an account to him. But in this case, it didn't work. In this case, the problem is that by this time exactly in 65 CE, there are conspiracies among the senators in Rome uh, that are taking shape against Nero. They're actually trying to kill him because they see they see him as degenerate. Uh, he, right. he undertakes in this year a uh, famous uh, tour of Greece where he begins to uh, act on the stage, uh, perform in shows, participate in athletic contests, which he always wins, by the way, uh, amazingly. Uh -huh. Is this the same time period where Vespasian supposedly falls asleep yeah. while Nero is? Yeah. So yeah. what happened? So Vespasian is with Nero on this Greek tour uh, of of sixty five sixty six. Um, yeah, exactly. He's he's with him as part of his entourage, and he has to watch all this stuff. Like he, you know, he's a very accomplished, you know, tough guy. The war guy. And he has to just kind of sit in the audience and smile. And so, you know, he starts to doze. And the uh, <laughs> uh, one story is that he he just walks out of a performance. Uh, that's the situation in which uh, Nero will send him to Judea. He sends him from Greece, actually, uh, not from Rome. So to... does he, he doesn't banish him or like make him like, like I think it's Tacitus. One of, one of the writers was like, Nero was so angry that he could have killed Vespasian, but people convinced him not to. So it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, I mean, these are the kind of uh, gossipy, gossipy stories that get it, you know, we, we don't really know. Yeah. Um, most emperors took this kind of stuff in their stride. You know, they, they had a sense of humor about it. Everybody's outraged at the thieving of, uh, of money from the temple treasury. Of course they are. But then the question is, how do you respond? You know, like, use your noggin. You know, how, what's the safest way forward now? And here you have a whole spectrum of responses, right? So on on one side, the impulsive response is, look, these are not Romans. These are these schmucks that ha have hated us for so long, these auxiliary fighters, right? We can take them on. Uh, you know, they're not such great stuff. We'll go arm ourselves. And so you have a, a split of factions led by different people, but one of them goes goes down to Masada where King Herod had stored a bunch of weapons, weapons, again, being uh, swords and clubs and state, you know, staffs and just stuff that's made to, to fight with, um, is, is at Masada. So according to Josephus, they go down and grab a bunch of these weapons, load them up on a wagon and take them back to Jerusalem to arm themselves against the auxiliary garrison, which is only... Well, only it's a few hundred guys, right? It's usually around 500, 480, 500 guys who are, no, that, that's a lot of armed fighters. But if, if you can get together a few hundred others and arm them, it's, it's, it's at least a conceivable conflict, a contest, right? You might be able to chase them out. And, and these guys are really brutal. I mean, they're following Nero's orders. And Josephus even says at one point, 
when the Jews accused Gessius Florus of, you know, being a, a bastard for taking all this money, he said, look, I'm just doing what the emperor told me to do. Wow. Uh, in Josephus, he comes across as a really bad guy, but he does allow him to say that. And that seems to be true. He was just doing what Nero told him to do. And because of the, to come back to a point I began to make before, because of the conspiracy of the senators against Nero at this time in 65, 66, he's very suspicious of, of senators. And some of them are governing provinces, right? And like the two guys, two brothers who are governing in upper and lower Germany, he he invites them to kill themselves. <laughs> like, uh, okay, your, li your life is over. Please, uh, please die right now. Um, wow. Uh, this was the honorable way to die, right? Instead of being executed, just uh, I'll let you guys kill yourselves. But I want you to know, you know, you, you have to do it. And, and from the East, a very senior guy, probably late 60s by now, named Corbulo, who had won a great victory for Nero against the Parthians and en enabled him to have a magnificent celebration in Rome in 66 CE of his uh, uh, um, agreement with Parthia, like a big diplomatic agreement that was all won by Corbulo. Then, Cor then, then Nero invites Corbulo to, uh, to, to uh, Greece and tells him to kill himself as well because he's he fears that he's involved in these senatorial conspiracies and he's a very powerful guy. He's got a lot of support as a great commander, whereas Nero is still, Nero is still not even 30 yet. After like 14 years in power, he's still very, very young. And he knows that the generals and the real, you know, the real men, the real fighters, the real experienced leaders look down on him as a, as, as a goof, you know, um, cause, cause he doesn't have any, he doesn't have any substance to him, right? He's just right. A, a flake. Uh, so he knows that and he's very sensitive to it. And so he's ordering all these guys in their sixties to, 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 you know, end themselves. Um, so what that means for Judea is that Cestius Gallus, we've got to keep these names straight. Cestius Gallus is the, the senatorial legate in charge of all of Syria, including Judea. Uh, whereas Gessius Florus, whose name sounds a little bit similar, he's a much lower ranked equestrian guy who is Nero's agent to collect the money. Now, as I said, ordinarily, the senior guy would be able to boot the younger guy, the junior guy out. And so you go back to Rome and explain yourself to the emperor. That would have been the case under Augustus, Tiberius, Claudius. But under Nero, no way. There's no way that this senator is going to confront the man that Nero sent out, even though he's officially of much lower rank. Because Nero is, is using these guys, his, these equestrian financial guys to undermine the senators. Also, uh, Galba, who's a, who's a senior senator in the West in Spain. He, according to the stories we have, is very upset that Nero's men are coming and taking money from his province. There's not a thing he can do about it. He just has to zip it. Um, and that seems to be the same situation in Judea. So to come back to your question, Neil, the big question of today, um, how did the war break out? It seems to me that it's not so complicated, but it's in much more at a much more human level than this kind of idea, this theological idea, as I would put it, that the Jews were were, you know, zealots. They were resistant to Roman rule. They, they just uh, couldn't stand the oppression of Rome. I can't see it. I mean, I think that things were going very well for Jerusalem all the way until the mid 60s when, when particular events in Nero's uh, reign and from Nero's ambitions and Nero's wishes and needs, financial needs, drove him 
to uh, aggravate the situation in Judea in a new way that had not happened before. And all the normal ways the Jews would have for redress, the, no the ways they would normally appeal to the, to the legate in the north, they would normally appeal to the emperor for relief from whatever's going on in Judea. Those doors were closed now. And now they realized that the emperor was their enemy. He'd suddenly become their, em their enemy, not because of any fundamental conflict with Rome, but because Nero was behaving in such a nasty way. And they, they, they couldn't get any help from Cestius Gallus because he was, he was handcuffed. Um, he, he could not act a, a, in a disloyal way uh, to, to Nero, right? He just had to zip it and accept the, the junior guy. So uh, now things just went from bad to worse. And, and I mentioned before there was a spectrum of responses. Some people armed themselves and, and they went as far as to besiege the, the auxiliary garrison in Jerusalem. And in to hold it up, first of all, in the Antonia Fortress, uh, where which was its main kind of base, and then they kicked them out of, they drove them out of there into King Herod's old palace, uh, uh, which was also kind of had thick walls, and and the auxiliary is hiding in there and trying to stay safe, and finally they they promised them, according to Josephus. It's the only story we have. Right. Uh, they promised them safe passage if they will put down their weapons. So they come out and put down their weapons, and then they massacre them. Uh, wow. So this is like, okay, <laughs> things are really getting out of hand now. And at the same time, according to Josephus, over in Caesarea, where there's always been anti-Judean sentiment building up, right? That's where they celebrated Agrippa the first death. He says that at the same time, the Caesarean majority population massacred its Judean minority. Wow. So you have uh, the Jews massacring the auxiliary garrison, which is from Caesarea and would be due to go back home there. And the people of Caesarea massacring their Judean minority. Now it's natural to suspect one was a, a response to the other. Uh, Josephus doesn't say that. He says they happened at exactly the same time uh, by some mysterious uh, coincidence, yeah. uh, which is you know hard to believe historically. But anyway, they both happened. And the result was that uh, the whole region lights up now. And on, in terms of the spectrum of responses, however, it's clear that you have a lot of people, especially the more senior uh, priests in the temple saying, okay, 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 we've got to calm this down. We've got to de-escalate this somehow. Yes, this is terrible. Yes, it's atrocious. But there's no point just fighting. I mean, that's not, we're not going to survive that. Um, we've got to try to calm things down. And so Agrippa II is brought in to try to help, and the senior priests try to calm things down. But long story short, it doesn't work. Would you say this is like the Franz Ferdinand moment? The or yeah. um, is that is that what his name? Franz Ferdinand. The, the guy. Franz Ferdinand. Uh, yeah, the the uh, the heir apparent in uh, uh, Austria Hungary who was. Yes. Yeah. So this is comparable to that. This is the shot heard around the world sparks off this. Uh, well, yes and no. Yes and no. The, the difference is that with Franz Ferdinand and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, of course, I think it's very clear now that, that the situation in Europe from you know the late 19th century to 1914 was extremely tense That's with true. these major powers arming themselves uh, and preparing for a massive conflict. And so that was the that was the you know the spark that ignited that conflict. Uh, so in that sense, this was a spark, yes. But I there don't this much build up. Yeah, I don't think there was this. There there were not you know armies ready to fight each other. And so when this happens, is Vespasian still in Greece with Nero? 
or is he getting sent out already? Yeah, so so now what happens is in a very short space of time, this guy, Kestius Gallus, who's the governor of all Syria and is responsible for keeping the peace in Judea, he's really between a rock and a hard place. Um, and so he decides reluctantly, very reluctantly, it seems, in in autumn, when the weather's already turning, you know, in the highlands of Judea, it's already turning wet and uh, it's going to likely snow. And it's, it's I, I lived through, you know, a modern uh, winter once in uh, Jerusalem. It's amazingly cold. Oh, really? And, yeah. Yeah. Um, because there's no generally no really good or there was when I was there no really good central heating, and so you kind of went to bed with all your clothes on, and, you know, um, and and it it can often snow and it certainly rains a lot from October November through to like February March, the rest of the year you can go with not a cloud in the sky from wow. you know March to October or so hardly ever see a cloud in the sky. But through through the winter, it's it's not a good time to be there. So Cassius Gallus decides very reluctantly to take a, a legion south to sort this all out, and he takes Agrippa the second, the Judean king, with him, thinking, okay, well, you know, they'll let him into the city, and he can, you know, we'll find out who the troublemakers are. We'll sort this out. We'll, right. I don't want to do this, but. But here's the problem. First of all, the legion he takes, the 12th legion, is a rebuilding legion. It was almost destroyed under Corbulo um, because of Corbulo's, I can't get into all the details, but Corbulo's predecessor really screwed up. And, and that's why Corbulo came in to save the day with Parthia. Uh, the 12th legion had been almost destroyed by the Parthians in 63. So, that's right. So uh, uh, um, uh, Cassius Gallus, in choosing that legion to bring south, he's it clearly doesn't think it's going to be a big problem. He doesn't take his best legion, the tenth uh, Fratensis. He doesn't take that legion. He leaves it up on the you know near the um, uh, near the Euphrates River, which is the frontier with Parthia. He leaves the, those legions in place. But he comes down quickly and picks up from Raphanaya, which is on the way south, the rebuilding 12th Legion, apparently to kind of give it some, 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 some experience, some, an easy kind of, you know, minor expedition, right. policing expedition. So what happens is when he gets to Jerusalem with Agrippa, uh, as they're nearing Jerusalem, Agrippa sends a couple of his spokesmen ahead to say, okay, we're coming. Can you please open the gates? Uh, we we want to talk this through. And those two guys are, are 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 one is killed and one is beaten within an inch of his life, and they escape back and say, you know, they they don't want us uh, to to come. We're going to be in trouble. So now Kestius has got this legion with him. He says, well, we got to press on. So he arrives outside the gates of Jerusalem and assumes they're going to let him in. He's got a legion with him, after all. And he's he was just in the city in the spring and uh, had a very warm reception. And people have been coming and going out of the city, so he, he's sure he can get in, right. but he can't. They, you know, it's a, it's a walled city, and it only has a few gates, and half a dozen gates. So when those gates are bolted shut and the walls are thick and high, you can't get in unless, I mean, even Titus, when he arrives, years later with uh, with four legions for the siege. He can't just waltz in, right? It's, yeah, yeah. Um, you're, you're stuck outside. So Kestius finds he can't get into the city. And so he, has to, he hasn't got any supply lines. He hasn't, he hasn't prepared for a siege, nothing like that. So he has his men forage around for food for a few days. And then he decides, well, to hell with it. Uh, you know, we better go home back up north and we'll come back in the spring when it's uh, ready for, you know, fighting season. And I'll bring a couple of legions with me and we'll really sort this thing out. But <laughs> when he's retreating, he has to go through a steep pass down these stone cut uh, steps where the army has to go single file at a place called Bet Choron, uh, which is where the uh, landscape descends quickly from 
the hills down to the plain, uh, down to the plain so he can head north. So it's a very short period where the army has to, like a kilometer or so, where they have to go very steeply down these rock cut steps. And the Judean fighters are feeling very uh, confident now because they they feel like they've chased them away. They wow. They had to leave quickly. So they, because they know the terrain very well, they set themselves up uh, at uh, near Bet Horon, and as the army is descending, they start to hurl projectiles down on them, wow. and they they manage to kill. Josephus says like five thousand, uh, three hundred of them. Wow. I think that could be you know Josephus' numbers are almost always multiples of ten or even a hundred, um, <laughs> bigger than be like five hundred. You think it could be five hundred? It could be still three hundred. It's a lot of people anyway, yeah. and it's enough. So the reason I go into all that explanation is to say the garrison uh, massacre was was one thing, but this thing now, the assault on the more. legion, that's really, I mean, there's there's no way that Rome can Can't take respond. this sitting down. There's absolutely no way. And there's going to be, there. you know, as the name of that film with Daniel Day-Lewis was, there will be blood. Blood. <laughs> yeah. Especially after this.